Hello, everybody. Uh, it's 4.30. I figure it's time we can get started. Um, if you're coming on in, grab a seat. This is Open Telemetry 101. Let's instrument specifically for traces. Today is sort of a observability 101 and a tracing 101. Uh, the most important thing to know at the top is all of these slides are available. You can, uh, if you don't trust QR codes, there's a bit.ly link for you. Um, no worries. This workshop will be available after KubeCon. So if you are running out of power um, and your laptop dies, there's something with the network, um, you can't grab Podman in time, whatever it takes, um, you can access this workshop at any time, free of charge, um, extend it, modify it for your use case. Um, so no worries. Take this workshop at your own pace. Um, and I'll leave this up for a couple more minutes as people are finding their seats. But thank you all for coming. It's really lovely to see so much interest in OTEL and tracing. It's my favorite telemetry type. And I'm excited to share it with you today. I have with me two helpers right over there. If they can raise their hands, stand up. If you are working on the workshop and you get stuck, um, raise your hand and uh, one of them or me will come over and see if we can debug and help you out. The way this workshop will go is I'll present some content. We've got about five labs, um, but this is sort of a work at your own pace. So if you want to skip ahead or there's stuff you already know, it's really for your benefit and your learning. All right. We've got a couple more people finding their seats. Welcome, welcome. Okay, the second thing that is important to know, other than the QR code, is there are a few prereqs that uh, you may want to get started downloading, one of which is Podman. If you haven't heard of it, it is a alternative to Docker. There's a lot of other use cases for it, um, but that is what this workshop is set up. So um, grab a link to Podman, uh, download it for your system. Python 3, um, we'll be working on a Python 3 application. Um, and then I should have added a comma here. Python 3 is one dependency, and then the sample application, the repo, is another. So while folks are streaming in, make sure you've got those three set up. Um, and if the Wi-Fi is a little iffy, you've got, there's one whole intro to observability, so you can kind of keep retrying. All right. Okay. We'll take things away. So um, if you have this loaded on your laptop, I kind of recommend having one window with the slide deck and one window with your editor um, or another browser. Um, this is sort of how you can get around the slide deck. Everything that is green text are links you should click. Um, I do not have video images, and then we've got some code snippets in there. So we're, we're ready to get started. Lab one, observability primer. We start each lab with a goal. So here is really just making sure we all have the same understanding of common terminology. Observability loves to throw in scary academic sounding terms, and I just want to demystify those and get those understood up front. And let's understand where OTAL fits in the landscape. So what is observability? There's, you ask 10 different people, you get 10 different answers. I think it's how effectively you can understand your system behavior from the outside using the data it generates. Monitoring, on the other hand, is the continuous process of watching and tracking system health based on a predefined set of data. I think of monitoring as like the smoke alarm in your house. It's checking for smoke particles. It will alert you when it senses those in the air. It's kind of always watching. What is telemetry? The process of recording and sending data from remote components to a backend. Um, and when we talk about software telemetry or infrastructure telemetry, that is typically metrics, logs, events, and traces. And if you've been to some of the OTEL talks today, you know that uh, we will soon be adding another type, which is profiles. So um, telemetry is really just about sending this sort of data um, from one device to either a central backend or a proxy. What is instrumentation? This is the code that records and measures the behavior of an app or infrastructure component. Um, we can really break down instrumentation, I got a slide later, into three kind of categories. 
There's the auto instrumentation, which uh, is mostly what is marketed and is really the first step most orgs take, um, especially with open telemetry. Sort of out of the box, you flip on or toggle um, auto instrumentation, and boom, you get some data. There's programmatic instrumentation, which is where you're manually bringing in libraries, setting up some configuration, and then, of course, manual instrumentation when you're adding those custom attributes. And that, all of that primer brings us finally to open telemetry. What is it? Why do we care? Standardized set of vendor agnostic SDKs, APIs, and tools to adjust, transform, and send telemetry to observability backends. If you've been to talks, you know how real the vendor agnosticism is. Um, there's a lot of wonderful cooperation um, across all of the vendors in the observability space, and we all can play nicely in the OTEL sandbox. Unsurprisingly, OTEL is a part of the CNCF. Um, it's joined back in 2019. So one thing I think gets a little bit confused about open telemetry is what it is not. It is not just a tracing tool, although we did start with tracing. That was kind of our first signal to GA. Um, we have expanded into all of the other signals. Um, and interestingly enough, OTEL is not a back-end or storage system. It is the pipeline and the set of libraries to generate the data, to transmit them, maybe transform them, and then export them somewhere else. And it is also not an observability UI. And that is why in this workshop, we needed to bring in an, uh, a UI for tracing, and in this case, I chose Jaeger. Um, but that is because that is not uh, the purview of OTEL to get into um, st storing this data long term or visualizing it. When we break down the OTEL components, we've got APIs defining the data types and how to generate the data, the SDK, which are defining language-specific implementations, plus some configuration, data processing, and exporting. You are in luck if you work in one of these languages, because these are the supported ones with open telemetry, although I am sure the community would be happy <laughs> if you were to find another language and add it to this group. Uh, uh, we will be looking at the registry, but if you want to take a chance now, that green text, again, green text is a link you can click on. That will take you to the Open Telemetry registry where you can see um, for the apps and libraries and frameworks you use on the daily if there's already instrumentation out there. So in our case, we'll be relying on the Open Telemetry instrumentation Flask library, which is built on the OTEL middleware, and we'll just be observing a very simple web application. Again, this is what the registry looks like. Um, you can check to see if your favorite library is instrumented. And the one component that we won't be using today, but I think is important to understand overall about open telemetry, is the collector, um, which is an open source proxy that receives processes, um, transforms with OTTL, um, the open telemetry transformation language, um, your telemetry data, and can export it out to various backends or storage. So this is a little rehash of what I covered before. We, I really break down instrumentation into kind of three concepts. The automatic, what you get out of the box just by installing something. The programmatic, where you're mixing pre-instrumented dependencies and manually adding metadata and manual. I think a, a misconception is that if you're manually instrumenting, you're manually instrumenting anything. No, um, what I hope you take away from this workshop is that you can do any sort of mixing and matching from automatic to programmatic and manual. It's not one or the other, one versus the other. You actually probably need to rely on all three types to get the best visibility. Great. Um, like I said, auto, automatic instrumentation is great uh, because you don't have to take, make code changes. Um, if you've got service mesh running, that's something you kind of get out of the box um, with tracing. And we'll take a closer look at, we'll have a lab on auto instrumentation, programmatic, and manual. So no worries about catching up on the code there. So look at us. We completed lab one. We've got a common understanding of some of the terminology that we throw around in this observability space, and we looked at a high-level overview of the components of open telemetry that are going to be relevant for us today. So now we will be installing and configuring open telemetry in our demo app.
And um, yes, there's some resources that you can find at the end of every lab. If you have questions or maybe issues that come up, you're please uh, free to submit them to the GitLab repo associated with this or get in touch with me on Mastodon or email. So this is where the fun starts. This is the interactive portion. Um, and if you joined us a little bit later, uh, you need Podman, Python 3, and then grab the GitLab repo with the sample application. So what we want to do for automatically instrumenting is we want Otel to get set up on your machine. We want to configure the SDK, run our demo app, and view trace data in the console. We're going to start building these concepts up one by one. All right, we will be working with a Python Flask app. I specifically chose Python because we've got a really lovely, strong set of documentation in the Python community, the Python agent, and a lot of great code examples. Um, this is, you can kind of fill in the blank with your favorite framework, um, but for today, we'll be doing Python. All right, so we will begin. I imagine this is where folks may run into some issues as we get to the interactive component, and again, you run into a snag, raise your hand, and me or one of um, my very helpful helpers will come around and try and debug with you. But this one, this step, I think, should be pretty easy. Let's make, let's make a project directory, and let's CD into it. You can name it whatever you want, but uh, it's probably best if you copy-paste. <laughs> Next, you're going to want to download the demo app. This is a Python Flask app. It is very simple. It's got three endpoints, nothing too fancy there. Um, you can grab a Git clone, uh, HTTPS, SSH, choose your own adventure. I'll leave this up just for a little bit to make sure folks have time to grab it down. Oh. All right. And now we want to just explore our demo app. What are we going to be instrumenting? What do we need to get visibility into? We we're starting with no instrumentation. We don't know anything about this app as it's running. We've got three routes that we're going to look at today. We've got our basic slash, and it is just going to display the count of how many times you've loaded that page um, for that session. Um, we have Doggo, an endpoint that calls out to the dog API and fetches a random photo of a dog. It is very delightful. I have a little fun today. And finally, Roll Dice, which is just going to display the result of a randomized dice roll, a number between like one and six. So pretty simple, nothing too, nothing too gnarly in the code today. Because really what we want to focus on is learning the concepts of tracing, the concepts of instrumenting with traces. So I really wanted to slim down um, the complexity. And <laughs> so we begin. Once you've gotten that sample repo down, go ahead and get into that directory and we will build our first image. Um, and again, I did all of this testing with Podman. So if you do run into a Docker problem, I wish you luck. I may try to help, um, but this is the how the workshop set up. And this is why I wanted to make it available after the fact so you can kind of hack on this at your own leisure. So we'll start by building a image, Podman builds. We're going to tag it. We're calling this app Hello Hotel, a little simple. Um, oh gosh, and I did put a Docker file. I thought I changed that to container file. That's fine. You'll know you're successful when you get um, a message like below. It will obviously be a different ID. Once you've got an image, now we can run this container. Mm, okay, So you're going to run this command. You can copy paste, but let me just walk through what's going on. Um, we've got port 8000 exposed in the container, mapping to our local port on 8001. There may or may not be, I may or may not have changed it to 5000 later on. I really hope I didn't. We will find out. So. Once you get this running, we are going to, there's this little command that snuck in here, open telemetry instrument. That is the component that is going to be doing our auto instrumentation for us. You open up the source code, you'll see there's no OTEL libraries being installed. We're totally doing this from the outside with the OTEL agent. We are going to export our traces to the console. We're going to 
export some metrics, but we're not going to be working with metrics today. And then Flask Run is what we give to the application to start it up. Once you've got that running, go ahead and open up localhost 8001 and confirm <laughs> that for that slash endpoint, you see this web page has been viewed one time. And note, I am a back-end engineer, not a front-end, so there's not a lot of pretty uh, CSS or anything happening. So once we've gotten there, we can kind of confirm your setup's working, the app's working, Podman's working, we're ready to move on to the next step. If this is causing a problem and you do not get to this web page has been viewed one time, you are, please raise your hand, we'll come help or you can kind of follow along as we go and just kind of see how the slides run. So just a quick show of hands is, are people getting this running? I just want to get a little temperature, okay? A few, yeah, good. All right, and again, please, we, we do want to help you. <laughs> so raise your hand and uh, we'll come over. Okay, so if you confirm that that's working, go ahead and just stop that container Control C. And now we're going to run interactively and use a little tool called OpenTelemetry Bootstrap. And what that will do is go ahead and detect whatever installed libraries we have in the app. And in this case, it'll see, oh, there's the Python library for Flask. It will go out to the registry and find relevant instrumentation packages to bring in. This is the magic of auto instrumentation that happens. So go ahead and run your container, map your ports, run it, run the image that we just built, and then go ahead and make sure that you get into a shell. Once you are in that shell, we're going to pip install the, both the OpenTelemetry distro and OpenTelemetry exporter OTLP. OTLP is the OpenTelemetry language protocol, and that is what speaks OTEL traces and spans um, from one system to another. So we need both of those things. PIP is what uh, Python uses for package management. And once you're in there, you can run OpenTelemetry Bootstrap A install. And that's what will go out and grab all those dependencies and those instrumented libraries for us. And um, you know you'll be successful because you should be dropped into root into that container. Uh, well, I guess it depends on how you set up the Podman VM. But if you're just doing it all kind of like vanilla from the start, you should be dropped in as root. Now, you can run the auto instrumentation agent. And this is where we're going to lean on open telemetry instrument, that command. We're going to, again, this looks very similar to our app run command, right? But we're wrapping it in the open telemetry instrument kind of agent there. So we've kind of changed our our run command, we've added this up top, and what we should get is some verification. So if that is working, you can go ahead and open up localhost 8001, make a couple requests, generate some traffic, and you should see in your console, and no worries if this is super small, what you should see are spans appearing in textual form. This is this is what a span looks like when it's not visualized in a UI. It's this blob of information. And that is how you know that you have successfully wrapped our Flask app in the Otel auto instrumentation agent and are getting span data. This is success at this point in the workshop. I'm going to pause because I don't want to get too far ahead and see, raise a hand are we at this point? Have, are you able to verify your auto instrumentation or should we pause a little bit and maybe walk around and do some helping? Raise your hand if you're successfully at this point. Okay, okay. All right, okay. We got some. And again, um, if you missed in the beginning, there is a QR code and a bit.ly link you can follow along and this is totally available after KubeCon. Um, so no worries about fitting it all in today if you run into a snack. Great. So we were interactively in our container. We need to get out of there. Uh, so just type exit, um, or some systems you may need to control C out of there. 
Great, so what we did is confirmed that without making any code changes, we were able to get span data um, automatically just by wrapping our command with the OTEL instrumentation agent. Now, let's go ahead and add a span attribute. In this case, we wanna just see how many times the page has been loaded. Maybe that's an interesting metric for us to track. So we're gonna hop into your IDE or your text editor or whatever you're using to write code you're most comfortable with, open up that sample application and find app.py. What we're gonna do now is manually import the open telemetry library and we're gonna modify the index method. That is what is attached to the slash route for this app. So the things you're gonna bring in from open telemetry, import trace. You're going to instantiate a tracer. So we've gotta make sure we've got something that's tracking all of our spans. Now oh, we'll just call it demo app. You can call it whatever you'd like, hello hotel. And then we're gonna drop into the index method. When we're manually instrumenting, you've got to start the span yourself. And so we're gonna say with tracer, start as current span, which means this method I'm in, we're gonna start a new span right now. You should call it something meaningful and relevant to you. So in this case, load homepage works. Um, and then I always just like to type out fully, um, we're gonna reference that variable as span. Some people shorten it to S, I just like to be very explicit. And then the next line you'll add is span.set attribute. Attributes are key value pairs, and so we'll call this page load.count. And then you're going to give it the value of hits, which is how many times that page has been loaded. So when we've done that, we're going to do this loop many, many times um, in this workshop. We will make some code changes. We will rebuild our container image. And then we're going to load up our app, send some traffic to it, and then look at our trace data. This is a loop we'll do over and over again. Um, you are more than welcome to write a little script. Or if you've got your Podman VM that's like mounted to your directory, uh, you can kind of do this stuff on the fly. Um, but for the ease of use, we'll just kind of run through these commands as is. So go ahead and rebuild your image, uh, same kind of command as before. Make sure you get that success message that things are building. Run our container. Copy paste this command. I don't know that I want to read all that command out. Um, please copy paste liberally and get this application running. The way that we're going to verify this manual instrumentation, what we've done is add what we should see is when we load up our home page, we should see in our console a span pop up that specifically <laughs> um, has this in this attribute block, block page load count one or however many times you refresh. I like to refresh like a man, madman, so mine always gets up to like seven or eight. Um, and that is how you know that we've successfully piped through that manual um, attribute there. We will not be working with spans in textual form for long, I promise. Uh, this is just the easiest way for us to constrain the space and get started um, early on. So I'm gonna pause right here and just do another temperature check. Raise your hand if you've been able to verify that this page load count is in your span payload. Oh, okay, now we're losing people. Okay, then again, please feel, feel, feel comfortable and free to raise your hand. Um, work with a neighbor or I've got two TAs. All right, we've got one person that needs some help. We are here. We've got another three, okay. Yeah, keep them up and uh, we will head over. And Vic, we got some, one here and one up front. We wanna make sure this is a good learning experience for you. Um, we got one right there. Um, perfect. Okay, when you've gotten to this point, we can go ahead and stop that container. We did a good job. This is this feedback loop that you should get used to as you're instrumenting code. I make my change. I need to validate, I need to run it, validate that I, what I expected to be there is there, um, and then move on to the next. So, <laughs> at this point, we will have completed lab one, and 
even if you ran into some issues with the auto instrumentation, programmatic instrumentations like a totally um, will be using a different image build and everything, so you can roll forward um, or we'll come over and help. Um, and if you're curious for some more resources, um, there's the Pato Python auto instrumentation agent config here, the open telemetry instrument man page if you want to do a little more digging on your own, um, and again, this project repo. And the OTEL official site, but that one's pretty easy to find if you just Google OTEL. Okay. And we've got one more up front. Okay. So when we're talking about programmatic instrumentation, like auto instrumentation is great. It's not that it's not this great thing. It's just there's a little bit of a dark side where people think that that is all they need to do. They treat auto instrumentation as the finish point um, instead of the launch pad. And I just don't think you're ever going to get the full visibility you need for context or business specific stuff without programmatically or manually instrumenting. So that's why I thought it was important to kind of show the differences. So to now, we'll move to programmatic instrumentation with OTEL libraries, and we'll finally bring in Jaeger for some trace visualizations because working with spans in textual form is just not, um, not my favorite. <laughs> so go ahead and head back to the IDE, open up app.py, and reset that file. So just um, you can kind of delete what you had and copy paste here. Um, this is what your file should look like. Um, and you can see our routes are very basic. <laughs> so we are going to update our imports. Um, this dots, the dots just mean there's more code there. I just wanted to focus on what we'd be changing. So we're going to import these libraries, Open Telemetry Instrumentation Flask. We're going to import Flask Instrumenter. That is what we'll be doing the programmatic instrumentation. What that means is the maintainers and authors of Flask have already taken the time to add open telemetry instrumentation, the spans and metrics or whatever you need to Flask. And we can just bring that in and we can kind of piggyback off of that. Um, you do not have, you should not really be manually instrumenting everything. I really think you lean on manual instrumentation for um, specific attributes and metadata, and then maybe some internal code paths that couldn't naturally be picked up by a framework. There's a couple, um, when we're bringing in the OTEL SDK, we're going to bring in two things, the console span exporter, I guess we'll still be working with the console a little bit, and then batch span processor. And what this will do is um, bring a bunch of spans in the queue, once that queue gets, you know, whatever size, it will then send off spans. So sometimes you're like, I've been sending traffic to my app. Where did my, where's, why don't I see traces? Well, maybe you need to make a couple more requests and make sure we have enough uh, to get a batch out the door. All right. And then we'll move to configuring the OTEL SDK. Um, so after our import statements and above any existing code, this will be the first thing that we want to drop in there. We're still in app.py. We're not going to be anywhere else for a while. Um, and this is the, all the config that we need to do. Set our tracer provider and get our tracer provider and make sure we're adding that batch span processor and the console span exporter. That's not a lot of config. It's kind of nice. It's not like totally making our app code horrible. It's, it's very minimal. And the last part we need to do is set up our programmatic instrumentation. So we've dropped in We've set up a tracer, we've set up the provider. Now we need to say, okay, this Flask instrumenter needs to run and do its thing. Um, and what we're instrumenting is our specific app instance. So go ahead and make sure this is reflected in your app.py. And, um, oh yeah, it's a little scroll. So if you're following along, you can, if you got a little bit lost or the lines didn't add up, you can kind of copy paste this like blessed version of the file. And again, this is this loop that we've been talking about where we'll rebuild the container image, we're going to run the container, and then we're going to send some traffic and validate our results. This is the loop you should get used to when you're instrumenting. 
So in this case, the only thing I've changed is that we're going to tag this programmatic in case you wanted to kind of head to head the, the manual versus the programmatic versus the auto instrumentation later. Um, we've just, I've tagged them differently per lab. Make sure you get the success message that you've built it and then go ahead and run. Only thing that would have changed from the last time is this programmatic. Everything else is the same, doing the flask run. And go ahead and same thing, just open up localhost 8001, confirm that, you, that the app is still running. And you can go ahead to roll dice, you can go ahead to doggo. What Flask Auto and what Flask Programmatic Instrumentation does, Flask knows about routes. So Flask will make sure that it tracks all of our calls to the different routes, but it doesn't know too much more about what we're doing on the inside there. So you won't see like the how many times this pet web page has been loaded, but you will see a span for the slash route has been called. So if you just do roll dice, for example, what you should see, what we get out of, out of the box with programmatic instrumentation is this representation of a trace. Um, and again, we didn't change any of our routing code. We just imported the Flask library, which is essentially what the auto instrumentation agent was doing for us. Um, go ahead and stop that container. And now we finally get to actually looking at these traces um, in Jaeger. Podman, like Kubernetes, has a concept of a pod, which is where you're running multiple containers and they share some resources. Um, so what we're gonna do is open up apppod.yaml, it's the YAML you know and love, um, and just make sure you're comfy with what we're doing here. We're bringing in the Jaeger all-in-one container. This is not production ready. This is specifically um, for local testing, just in case you were wondering. And then the ports that you need to care about, 16686 is the port for Jaeger's web UI. 4318, of course, is uh, for sending uh, the OTEL data, and then we're going to make sure that the collector OTLP is enabled so Jaeger knows to receive OTEL data, and we're going to be sending it via OTLP. Okay, so your other container should be stopped, um, so just make sure that's happening. You can always do a podman PS um, and see what, what's running. Um, and the way that you run a pod in podman, podman play cube, and then pass it your pod file. Uh, you should get a success message that not one, but two containers have spun up, one for our app and one for Jaeger all-in-one. Uh, Jaeger natively supports uh, sending OTEL data, so we, um, all the config that we had to do was also pretty minimal. The stuff all plays nicely together. You'll know you're successful if you can open up localhost 16686, um, and you will see the very, very cute um, Jaeger mascot, this little gopher detective, he's following the footprints, the trace. Um, this is what success looks like for this part. And let's go ahead and generate some traffic. Um, make a few requests to localhost 8001, to doggo, to roll dice, um, and kind of see what you get out of the box in Jaeger. What you should see is the Hello Hotel or whatever you have named your service um, in the dropdown, and you should see some little dots for the request representing each request that you've made. Um, and then, you know, like I said, I love to refresh stuff. So I made ten traces. You may make one or two. And okay, not a hand. Um, this is what this is where we're at now. Jaeger has a lot of really beautiful ways to visualize traces. One common visualization you will see is a trace waterfall. Um, you can go ahead and click, so if you see down here like, hello, Hotel Doggo, you can click that and be taken into the trace waterfall view. Um, this trace waterfall, if you look at the Chrome Dev Tools, sort of like their waterfall diagrams, or mm, it's not quite a flame graph, but this should be, this is a visualization you turn to when you want to examine in detail one particular request that was traced. Um, and you can get all sorts of helpful attributes. If you click on one of the spans, it should open up into this nice little table. So <laughs> if all of this was working for you locally, then we have 
completed programmatic instrumentation um, and successfully sent and viewed some traces in Jaeger. Um, leave your pod running because next up we're gonna talk about the visualizations and you may wanna explore that on your machine. All right. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, what is Jaeger? It is an open source uh, distributed tracing system. It spun out of Uber um, when Uber was um, sort of had their Death Star of microservices and they really needed tracing to understand the complexities of uh, the path that one single request could take in their system. Tracing was their answer. So they built Jaeger and originally Jaeger actually had its own ecosystem, its own instrumentation and format, but luckily uh, Jaeger decided to join forces with Otel or at least interoperate with Otel and has actively deprecated any Jaeger specific instrumentation in favor of Otel. So we use Jaeger today um, for the UI. Um, if you want to self-host distributed tracing backend and UI, that is also um, what some companies do. So Jaeger all-in-one, we're not gonna go super deep into Jaeger architecture because we're just using it for a UI, um, but there's two components that you should know about. The collector, um, which similar to the Otel collector, receives, processes, and sends that trace data, and Jaeger query, which exposes those APIs uh, for retrieving traces, and of course, our beautiful web UI that we are gonna be very comfy with soon. So this first page that you land on is sort of that default view of view. You can query for traces, you can query for spans, um, and you can look at traces in aggregate. Um, yeah, so you could say, maybe I wanna see everything that's status code 500, or I wanna see only traces from this specific service. This is sort of your homepage view is the Jaeger search console. Um, the scatter plot up there matches the traces that Jaeger knows about. And in the case of all-in-one, we're storing this data in memory, uh, which is again why it's not a production-ready system. Um, but if you wanna click, maybe you see, like in this example, wow, that's a very, you know, maybe that took a lot of time, or why is this dot so big? Kind of click on that and see the traces that uh, led to that. Um, table view, I think, is helpful if you wanna compare. So each of these traces should have a little checkbox. Maybe you wanna compare a trace from before and after a deploy or before and after a feature flag got flipped. Um, that is a very common use case, and so Jaeger supports that out of the box. Once you click on a trace, you get, again, taken back to this trace waterfall view. And when you're in running in a production system, maybe at scale in a cloud native architecture, you actually could have traces that have hundreds of services, thousands of spans, and it can get kind of overwhelming. So having this trace waterfall view where you can collapse groups of spans or spans from a particular service is really helpful to navigate as you're pinpointing maybe what's the source of latency or a specific error that you saw. We're gonna be working with really tiny traces today, um, but just know that uh, please make heavy use of collapsing spans because it can be data overload um, in a sufficiently big system. Um, yeah. You can even use, it's a little tiny, you can even use this a tiny search box so maybe you are looking at a 100 span trace. Maybe you just, you know that there's a specific attribute or property you wanna look at, like get requests, 400s, 500s, 200s, um, and so if you go ahead and type into this text box, um, one of those attributes, it will uh, bring you down to the span that uh, matches that. So that can be a helpful way if you know what you're looking for or you're curious if some attribute popped up in a trace and you don't wanna read the whole waterfall, um, that's one uh, thing that you can do. Again, the scatter plot, um, it's kind of a quick way to visually compare traces without getting into all the details of the spans and the attributes. Um, you could look for things that are out of the or ordinary or anomalous and clicking on that bubble, each bubble is a trace, um, you'll go to that trace waterfall detail view. Um, and then the table view, you can also sort by most recent, you can look at a dependency graph. There's really so many different ways that you can interact with and visualize this trace data, which is why I was really happy to leave the sort of JSON text representation of spans because this is the tracing that I know and love, um, being able to interact with it like this. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the trace table. Again, you can sort traces by duration. This is back on that home search page. Um, the amount of spans, so maybe if you saw, maybe for a request to check out, you normally see 
50 spans, and then all of a sudden you see a trace that has 300 spans, something might have went wrong there. Um, so being able to look at traces in aggregate and sort of sort and filter them is very helpful. Um, and then trace details. So again, clicking on a span, so you get to, you see the traces in aggregate, you find one that looks interesting, you click into it, you're taken to the trace waterfall, you find a span that's interesting, it's maybe in the critical path and taking a long time. It's got a wonky error message. Something about it doesn't look right. You can again zoom in more and drill into the details for that span. That is where all of the manual instrumentation of that metadata comes in handy um, so you can start to do some correlation. So the beauty of traces is you can go from that trace aggregate view. Oh, some of these requests look a little funky. Let me look at one of them. Hmm this is, I think, where the problem is, or it's this call to this database, and zoom into that span, and then all the way back out again. Traces are really great for that zooming in, zooming out as you're developing hypotheses as to what's going wrong, um, or maybe what's going right. Maybe you made a performance improvement and you just want to understand and explain how that happened and get that promotion. So it doesn't always have to be a bad use case when you're loading up the trace page. There are a couple other ways you can look at traces. Um, it is not super discoverable, but there's this tiny, tiny drop down on the right hand side. Uh, just follow it on your laptop. <laughs> um, you can grab a graph, a span table, and a flame graph if you are like really into flame graphs and that's how you troubleshoot best. I love the graph, or sometimes it's called the system topology view. This is what is going to show you is how the services relate to each other, and there's another view you can get of how each method or span relates to each other. You can change the color to highlight either what has taken the longest, what's in the critical path, or um, self times, which shows the longest span durations that weren't waiting on uh, children or other work to be done. This is experimental, um, so but it is something that you'll see in a lot of vendors as well. So the more you get used to exploring spans and traces um, in the graph view, it's really easy to bring that knowledge over to um, any sort of vendor. The spans table, again, if you're looking at a trace that has so many, so many spans and you just know that you're looking for an error is true or um, some other attribute, you can go ahead and even search within a trace um, just for a specific um, Maybe we're looking at the Jinja load or the HTTP GET. There's lots of ways that you can inspect and query this data. And I am not a flame graph person, but if you are, um, please feel free to use the flame graph view to visualize these traces. Um, you can, similarly to the waterfall, you can collapse the unnecessary details that you don't need to see or don't care about. Um, you can copy that function name to use in maybe a metrics query or a logs query in another system or even highlight similar spans within the trace. So that is why I wanted to bring Yeager today, um, because there are just lots of ways for you to visualize the data in a way that makes sense for you. And we'll take a quick look at comparing traces for change. I will say this is uh, comparing traces is what I used the most when I was troubleshooting as an SRE, but Jaeger has a very interesting way of showing them. I think there are some very nice options in, in vendors, and I'm excited to see what the OpenTelemetry desktop viewer does for trace comparisons. That is another project that is kind of getting started. So uh, why do you want to compare traces? Really, most of the time when I would get paged or someone would tell me something was wrong, I'm like, well, what changed? It was working before. Um, what is different? So I like to look at a trace a request that happened from when things were normal um, to afterwards when I got alerted or somebody told me something was wrong. Being able to compare that request path is super powerful. Um, and in our case, we'll think um, for our Doggo app, why did one request for Doggo take 685 milliseconds and the other only 281? Um, this is something you should be able to repro on the machine. Uh, it's a little hard to see there, but what we do now is click both of those checkboxes, hit compare traces, and you'll be taken to this view. They've decided to model the colors after code diffs. Um, so gray represents spans that are in both traces, so kind of fading into the background. You don't need to focus on those. That's what was similar. Red nodes red, or spans that were only in the first trace that you selected. 
green nodes or spans were only in the second trace you selected. And so if we look at, I don't think I can zoom in, but if you look closer, maybe on your machine, at this trace diff, you can see what was present in the first trace was compiling the Jinja template, which Jinja is what Flask uses for its HTML templating under the hood, um, and it's only done on the first time a page is loaded. So in this case, we were able to compare traces to say, oh, the first time that we make a request to this application, when it spins up, it takes a little bit longer. Obviously, it's not the end of the world. We're still under like a millis uh, one second. Um, but we can see where that latency came from. And so that's a small example that shows why trace comparison can be uh, super fast and helpful. And again, like why are there so many ways to visualize a trace? It's really because you have that ability to zoom out, looking at traces in aggregate, to zooming all the way down to an individual operation that happened to uh, take place for a request. And it'd be really overwhelming to try to shoehorn that in into one specific visualization or one single pane of glass, um, as the industry loves to say. And so for me, it's all about the ability to go from high level to low level, back up again, and you just need different visualizations to support whatever zoom level that you're working with. Okay, <laughs> so you can go ahead and stop the pod, um, or if you wanna keep playing with the visualizations, you can. But I think that means we will go to the next lab. Yes, so we reviewed our trace visualizations. We've kind of gotten a little more comfortable with the Jaeger UI. And now um, is the final lab on manually instrumenting metadata. This is the change we'll make to our instrumentation loop. We'll make some code changes. We'll rebuild our image. We will run our container. We will generate traces by sending requests to our app, and then we will load them up in Jaeger and see um, the results of our instrumentation. So we're adding one step to our instrumentation feedback loop, but it's still pretty manageable. All right, um, if you were really into the trace comparison, there's a deep dive blog that I've linked here in these slides. You can check out the Jaeger project site, or while you're here, go talk to a Jaeger maintainer, or talk to the Jaeger folks about what's going on in their world. Um, you can read about native OTLP support, and if you're really keen on bringing Jaeger to your org, it's a definitely a good idea to look at the deployment options you've got available to you, because all-in-one is not for production. I cannot say that enough. It is just for our local testing today. All right. And here we go. Lab five. And it's kind of a rehash of before, but again, automatic and programmatic instrumentation gets you most of the way to visibility. It is definitely better than nothing, but if you have the skills and can teach other developers the skills of manual instrumentation, you will be able to add specific metadata to your apps um, so that you can derive insights from your business. You will see um, some examples of what we'll be manually instrumenting now as we begin. So we'll head back to our IDE, open up app.py, kind of delete whatever we had there and go ahead and copy paste this um, reset app.py. Then we are going to manually bring in some libraries. Again, reinitialize our tracer provider, which is what creates the tracer that accesses and modifies span as we run our application. And we did like that Flask framework instrumentation. It was pretty nice to be able to see traces for the uh, attached to the routes we were making requests to. So we also want to bring back the Flask instrumenter. So um, we, could, we could go through this line by line, but I do promise you, you can copy paste that. We're bringing in some hotel libraries um, and we're bringing back the Flask instrumenter. And again, this is the, the loop we know. We will build our image make sure that we get that tagged. And in this case, only change is we're going to tag this as manual, just so that you've got a version of the programmatic, the automatic, and the manual. If you want to do some comparisons later on, uh, you would need to remap some ports to make that work, uh, but that's pretty doable. So the other change we'll make is over in app underscore pod dot YAML, which is our pod spec. Um, because we've changed our tag um, for the image we built, we need to make sure that our pod has that updated tag. Um, and then comment out that command block because 
We're manually instrumenting now, and we don't need the auto instrumentation agent to wrap our flask command. Um, because we're going to be running the OTLP span exporter and relying on Jaeger's native OTLP ingestion to send spans over HTTP. So we don't need open telemetry instrument anymore. We thank it for its service, but we are moving on to manual instrumentation. You should not have um, your pod running. If it was running from later on, go ahead and control C exit out and go ahead and play cube at pod.yaml. And again, we're back in our loop where we're making requests to our application endpoints. Um, I like to have a variety of traces, so maybe just make a couple to each of our endpoints. Uh, slash doggo and roll dice, and this is where I had 500. So we started out with using port 8000, so go ahead and swap that 5 to an 8. I'm very sorry, and we'll update this in GitLab tonight. So you'll know it's working if you can load up Jaeger, which again, localhost 16686. You don't have to select Hello Hotel from the menu, um, but Jaeger also instruments itself. Uh, so you will see Jaeger query pop up as a service. We really care about Hello Hotel span, so maybe just go ahead and select Hello Hotel as a service um, and confirm that you see traces that reflect the request that you were making to the application. And when that is all said and done, we are ready to add some manual instrumentation. We did this before, but it's important. This is people's first steps with tracing instrumentation where they just need to add a key value pair span attribute. Um, they are just metadata to annotate a span with just more information that might help you. The uh, sort of API call is span dot set attribute key and value both strings. In our case, we'll go ahead and because we're manually instrumenting, um, we'll declare a span, we'll call trace, we'll get the current span um, that is attached to index, and then we'll go ahead and set the attribute, again, hits the string, and then hits the value um, that comes from index. Very similar, we'll stop. Um, in our case, when we're stopping a pod, it is actually podman play cube um, pod file, and then dash dash down. Then go ahead and rebuild your Docker file, container file, and then run the pod again. Then go ahead and open up your browser, make a couple requests to localhost 8000. We know that, we started with eight, we'll stick with 8000. And go ahead and make sure that when you find a trace for that slash route, that you click on the span details page open up that span and make sure that you see right at the top in span tags, hits, and however many times you are refreshing that page. And this is where we think, okay, Flask auto instrumentation was instrumenting at the route level, but it didn't capture external requests or custom work. And our doggo endpoint we know calls out to the custom dog API. Um, we don't control that code. We can't add instrumentation there. Um, but that means if we only have Flask programmatic instrumentation and we are looking at traces for doggo, we don't really know how much time we spent calling out to the dog API and how much time we spent internally processing or pulling out the dog breed. It'd be super handy to know if it was a dog API problem or an us problem, if we needed to optimize this code path. And we don't have to stop at Flask programmatic instrumentation library. Let's see, oh, I got this out of order. Well, let's see what we get for Doggo. Make a few requests. Go ahead, open up Jaeger. Look at what we get for Doggo out of the box and you'll see it is just a one span trace, uh, which doesn't tell you a lot, but it does tell you how long it took to fulfill this request to Doggo. And what you'll notice if you look closely at the span tags is you'll see a span.kind, and it says server, which reflects that this span was generated from Flask's point of view, our application. And so again, we don't know how much time we spent waiting on the dog API. Maybe they had problems. Maybe they pushed out really buggy code that took forever. Um, all we would see from our end is longer and longer request times or higher and higher latency. And we wouldn't be able to figure out 
why are requests suddenly taking longer for the doggo endpoint. So we can instrument that. Go ahead and stop your pod. And what we want to do is look at what else we're doing with Flask. And if you look at that import statement, you'll see it import requests. Um, if you work with Python, you know that request is a pretty popular library. Um, and it might be possible that that maintainer was super kind and already instrumented for us. So we could be in luck, and all we need to do is import a library, just like we did with the Flask instrumenter, add a few lines of config, and then we'll get this extra visibility to our external HTTP requests. Actually, all HTTP requests. But in this case, we care about external. Um, so in a new tab, you can open up the Open Telemetry Registry. It's a good idea to get comfy opening up and exploring the registry just to see what's out there. You don't want to instrument more than you have to. Um, you can filter down to Python. You could filter even down to type instrumentation if you wanted type in requests, or um, you can click this handy green link and it'll take you right to, haha, -ha, the top result, which is yes, thank you. Um, I believe it is Kenneth who runs uh, the request. He's already done the work for us. So let's pull in this library. In order to do that, this is where the Python 3 dependency comes into play because we need to pip install this library and make some code changes locally. Python uses this concept of virtual environments uh, so that you can isolate system dependencies for another so you can have multiple versions of a Python library but they're all kind of isolated in different directories. Um, the way we create a virtual environment, Python 3-m, you can call it whatever you want. It's easy if you, if you stick with the copy paste here and then go ahead and activate that virtual environment. You know you will be successful if you run a pip dash capital V and you'll get this nice little long, <laughs> this not super nice long path. And as long as dot venv is in there, you know that you're activated and good. So at this point, now we can do the work. We've seen that there's this request library out there. We want to bring that into our application. We're going to pip install open telemetry instrumentation requests. Request is that name of that library. Um, Python uses a package management uh, requirements.txt to just track what we're installing. So you can go ahead and pip freeze, pipe that to requirements.txt to save your work. Um, and let's go ahead and configure this. Add an import statement near the top for um, importing our library, request instrumenter namespace, just the same as Flask instrumenter. And then right under our Flask instrumenter instrument app, go ahead and do request instrumenter dot instrument. Um, add a sufficient size or more complex application. You may just want to pull that out into a config file, but we're just working locally today and keeping it simple. Again, we want to rebuild our image. We'll still keep that manual tag, and we'll go ahead and run that pod. Great. We really only did work. Um, we were really curious about the doggo endpoint, so you can make requests to everything else, but make sure you make a few requests to doggo so that we can check out what we got by adding this new library. You can go ahead and search the Hello Hotel service and even drop down to the particular operation for slash doggo. And what we should see is that the span count has increased from one to two. So let's take a look at what we got. Our trace waterfall should show that first root span, that overall um, how long it took us to respond to that request to doggo. And we should see a child span underneath for an HTTP GET request out to the dog API. If you look at the span.kind, it is not server in this case. In this case, it is client because we are the client making an external request. That's one way that you can sort of sort through um, what side of the request that you're on. So all we had to do is bring in a library, add a little bit of configuration. We did not have to manually instrument the doggo API call, and we kind of got this out of the box. So while, yes, we're manually bringing things in, we're still benefiting from the programmatic, auto, the programmatic instrumentation. We'll go ahead and stop the pod. 
And now we'll kind of mix in some other manual instrumentation. So there's a little bit of work um, done in this doggo request to pull out the dog breed so that as you're loading it up, you know what kind of dog you're looking at. Because maybe you're a cat person, you don't know. It's helpful to have that info. You could imagine that was maybe a computationally expensive uh, method that we needed to run. It could maybe be running some crazy regex or something like that. And it might be helpful if we tracked our internal work in addition to the dog API. Maybe we saw that latency was up to doggo requests. We've confirmed that the dog API is still running super performant, and now we got to look internally. What is causing that latency? Well, we need to add some more instrumentation to track this internal work. This is where we're going to create a new span. So far, we've been relying on spans that have been kind of created from these programmatic libraries. And now we are creating a new span that these libraries could not have known about. This is where we're manually instrumenting. In this case, it is the get breed method. So we want to make sure we're not just creating the span and sending it into the ether. We want this span to be tied to traces that are related to re in this request path. So that means when we create this new span, it needs to be a child span related to that first overall doggo span. When we look at the OTEL API, it is tracer.startAsCurrentSpan to create a new span in the current trace context. Um, you can attach or unattach it. We will be attaching. So all of those words to say, open up app.py. It is a lot easier to create a nested span than to do that explaining. Head down to the fetch dog method, find the doggo route, go to fetch dog, and add that line with tracer start as current span. Um, I just called it the method name. Again, you can call it whatever you want. Um, and then we'll call it as child. And again, we will rebuild our image. We will launch a pod, um, make sure that you have the pod stopped, and generate some traces. So make a few requests to the doggo endpoint, and let's see what we got. What we're expecting to see is going from a trace with two spans to a trace with three spans. One overall tracking our request to doggo, one for our external call to the dog API, and then finally that internal work for get breed. It is not computationally expensive in our case, but um, it would be helpful if we knew internal work versus external work. So go ahead, after you've made some requests, open up Jaeger UI, that should be old hat by now, and search for traces for the operation doggo. We should, if everything goes according to plan, see three spans um, in these traces and go ahead and click on one of those to get the detailed view. So we get the doggo overall, what's called the root span. We have that get request. And now that third span at the bottom is operation um, for get breed. So now, now that we've mixed programmatic and this manual instrumentation, we could step back, step away from our computer and know if all of a sudden we get paged because it's taking super long to fetch these dog pics because they're really, really important to your business, um, you have a sense of, was it me or was it my dependency? And it took a mix of programmatic instrumentation and adding that manual span, which was not a lot of work, but did give us a lot more visibility. So when you're instrumenting, there's always this level of detail. What would you need to answer questions like that um, when you're on call or even when you're deploying changes? How do you know that your changes were effective? You should think about when it makes sense to add in that manual span or spanza. Uh, so again, you can visualize as a trace graph um, the waterfall, or you can go ahead, now that we've got more spans, it's more of an interesting trace, we can hop over to the trace graph and see that while it is simple with three spans, um, this is what the kind of operation map looks like. Um, Doggo is starting our request, and then it calls out to the API and does our little get read work. Um, also, if you wanted to visualize it by time, like what was in the critical path, what was taking the longest, click on the T uh, over the right-hand vertical bar menu, and that is going to highlight for, it's very helpful for very complex request chains, um, the spans that are in the critical path, which means it directly contributes to the slowest path. Um, 
that you have to, if you want to do optimizing work, you need to look at the critical path. So if you were working on doing some perf improvements, go ahead and trace it. Go ahead and flip on this color by time and see where you need to start honing in to do that work. Um, and again, like I said, we've been using some toy apps, uh, but here is an example with 160 spans looking at that trace graph. And you can see how powerful this bird's eye view is. And imagine if we had flipped on um, by time to see where your path of optimization should be. So this, uh, while we're focusing on learning instrumentation today, know that this stuff gets more and more helpful for the more complex uh, your distributed system that you're instrumenting. So those are creating a nested span and creating a span attribute. There is this concept called span events. Very confusingly in the Jaeger UI, it will show up as a span log. I do not know why. There are plenty of hotel maintainers here that can have that conversation with you, but let's go ahead and add a span event. It is basically a structured log with a name and one or more attributes and a timestamp. So that's kind of why we want to call it a log, because it's a timestamp with some textual metadata. When we look at the API, it's pretty simple. Span.addEvent, whatever you want to call it, page click, um, page load, whatever, and then your attributes. Um, so let's just look at the roll dice um, endpoints. So go ahead to the roll dice method. Go ahead and get the current span. We don't need to create a new span because we know that Flask's auto, Flask programmatic instrumentation has already instrumented this route. But so we just need to get a hold of the span that's already there, already going to be created. We roll our dice and we get some result that we maybe care about. And so go ahead and span dot add event roll dice. And maybe it's helpful for troubleshooting the future to know what the result of that role is. So the attributes is a map of key value pairs. In this case, we'll call it results and pipe in um, whatever the result of that dice roll was. So to see this again, very similar, stop your, stop your pod, rebuild your image, go ahead and run the new pod, send some traces over to the roll dice endpoint, and let's verify what this looks like in Jaeger. What we're gonna see when we click in to our trace view is, boom, we see this little thing that says logs. All of a sudden we've got this span event that shows up as logs um, with a timestamp. That timestamp is relative to the start of the trace itself. Um, just important to know. Uh, you can go ahead and click down and see whatever our result was. In this case, it was five. You could add a lot more logs here. Maybe you could tie it into the existing logs that your app has. Um, but span events are a really helpful way to enrich tr your traces. We can go ahead and stop this pod. And there's just a couple more attributes we'll get to, one of which is span status. A lot of times when you're looking at traces, um, you will the most important field that I relied on was error equals true. Um, that would mean for a given trace, one of the spans somewhere in there, maybe multiple, experienced an error, and that's probably something you want to look at and compare to a healthy trace or a green trace. Um, but maybe you're manually instrumenting, and maybe you need to manually change a span status. So maybe if we rolled a dice and a five meant something had gone terribly wrong, there's no way that the programmatic instrumentation would know that, so you would need to go ahead and manually set that span status. There's three, unset, okay, or error. And when a span status is set to error, that is, there's a lot of visual cues that pop up both in Jaeger and any vendor that you're using. Um, span status error is very, very meaningful. Uh, in our case, the API is just get the current span, set the status, either unset, okay, or error. And if you want to add a little description of what's going on, um, that would be very helpful to future you. So <laughs> we will simulate um, having an issue with uh, the Doggo API. So open up randompetpick.html and update our template to include a search bar. Plenty of things can go wrong when you give folks um, an open search bar. So 
there is a chance that whatever our user is searching for is not actually a dog breed that the dog API has, and that's an error or a case that we want to handle. Um, or the user could totally put it in nonsense or, you know, many, many things. So we want to pass to the template any error messages that we get resulting from validation we do on our end. Um, great. So we're going to go ahead and import a breeds list that I've copied over from the dog API. And then we're going to add a couple things to our Flask import statement there. Now we're going to head back to app.py, find our doggo route, and update the fetch dog method. So now we need to handle post requests from the search bar form. We need to validate the input. And we need to pass any error messages that we get to the template so that we show the user what you're searching for cannot be found here. And we should get a little message to ourselves as we're looking at this in the future. Hmm, this is what, they, this is what the users are searching for, and it didn't go according to plan. So you can go ahead and kind of copy paste this block, and we'll do our stop, rebuild, relaunch, generate traffic, open up Jaeger. So what you should see um, when you load up the doggo endpoint is this very beautiful search bar, um, and you can go ahead and start searching for things. Um, let's start with a valid search, though. Um, Husky, Greyhound, those are uh, definitely in the dog API, and you should get returned um, one of those adorable breeds. And now we want to test an invalid search. So uh, like macaw, which is a type of parrot, or tabby, which is a type of cat, or your name, um, go ahead and throw that in there, just something that will throw an error. And what we should see is that we've got this very nice error message for the user. Uh-oh, no breed found. But what helps us uh, as the operators understand what happened here? Go ahead and open up the Jaeger UI, search for traces for Doggo, um, and you'll see that there's no traces with uh, marked errors, which is kind of interesting, because we know that we just had to handle an invalid search case. Um, find your trace with the invalid search, and it is the one that'll only have one span. Um, or you can kind of just follow along up here. The reason it only has one span is because uh, it was fulfilling the post request the invalid search term failed our validation logic, which prevented us from even calling the dog API, um, because that would have just kicked back, um, you know, whatever the error message was, like the 403 not found, um, or maybe it's 304. It, dog API would have given us an invalid search anyway, and it would have given us a failed request, and so we just already dodged that by moving the validation in our app. Um, we passed our error message to the user, and we did successfully respond to that invalid search request to Doggo. But we know that there was kind of an error along the way or that things didn't go as planned. Um, we know, like in my case, I was searching for Tabby. But even when we look at the span details, we don't really see that something went awry. So we can instead set a span status. Because even though we successfully responded, um, it still may be important for us to track what users are putting in or what users um, are ending up on this error page. Uh, it will not make the entire trace failed if we set the span status, um, but it will be helpful for us as we're troubleshooting. So we'll go ahead and pop back into the doggo route. We'll update our fetch dog method, and we'll create a new nested span for these post requests handling that form search input. And for good measure, let's just see what users are searching by adding an attribute for breed onto that span. This will help us very much in the future debug and understand um, what the source of these errors are. And then we will update our error handling code. And this is where we are going to manually set our status to error. Um, we also might want to record any exceptions that pop up within the context of that span. So it'll be a child set status. And child, again, is um, what we're calling our new span that we created up here. We are going to set status, status code error. And we're going to record the exception. And this is in our try catch block. Again, bring down your pod, rebuild your image, bring the pod back up, send some requests to Doggo. 
make sure you have a healthy mix of valid and invalid search terms. So uh, Doberman, Akita, Husky, Greyhound, valid, Macaw, Tabby, Page, invalid, um, Calico, Fox. Then let's load up Jaeger and do a little bit of comparison. So ahead, going ahead to look for doggo traces, verify that there is at least one trace um, that has this, that was successful, but has this little red error box. That is what we did by adding, setting that span status to error. And you'll notice because we still technically did a successful response back to the user, we did load um, that beautiful user facing error message. We don't want to say this whole trace failed, this whole request to doggo failed because it didn't, but we do want to know mm, something didn't quite go right. And let's take a look at what that was. Um, going down into the search breed span. Since we recorded the error message, you can see uh, we did some custom error message, no breed found. You'd be like, okay, that's fine. Someone just didn't know what they were searching for. Um, and our breed made it as a span attribute. That's all super helpful stuff when you're investigating and troubleshooting to have that error message not locked away in logs, perhaps in another system, but right there in your trace as you're looking at things. So, oh my goodness, we've completed our labs, we've looked at auto-instrumentation, we've looked at programmatic instrumentation, and we've hopefully seen the value of manually instrumenting and that it, you do not need to manually instrument everything, but instead you want to have a nice healthy mix of programmatic and manual um, instrumentation. We've looked at all the different ways you can visualize traces, how you can add attributes, record errors, and most importantly, self-serve and look for the libraries you care about in the Open Telemetry Registry. We will not be taking distributed tracing with Otel in production. That is a lab I will be working on uh, later on. Keep an eye on this repo. Um, I do want to help folks move Otel into prod, but the focus of this workshop was just getting your feet wet with tracing, learning a little bit more about spans, and what you can do today to instrument some sample apps or applications you're running at work. We've still got this room for about 13 and a half minutes, so I'm very happy if you want to raise your hand and ask a question, or kind of talk shop, or if you ran into issues or have suggestions, um, I'll be kind of walking around. But I very much uh, appreciate everyone for coming to the workshop spending your end of your Wednesday hanging out and learning more about open telemetry. So thank you very much. <laughs>